Tonight we're at Psalm 25. And uh, next week, we'll begin moving a little bit quicker. We, we've been in a, a section of the book of Psalms where each psalm is so rich and is so full that we needed to slow down and we needed to really dig into them. We'll get now into a section of the book of Psalms where we can move a little bit quicker um, and, and we can maybe cover two or three in an evening. That'll be our goal. But tonight we'll cover just Psalm 25 and then we'll have a, a time of communion at the end. And so we're going to call Psalm chapter 25. Oh, cross-references are on the screen. I'll, I'll want you to turn in just a couple of minutes to 2 Samuel 16 and then at the end of the Bible study, chapter 18. But, but the Bible study tonight is titled The Mature Child of God. And I want to give you a bit of an introduction. I'll talk to you about the structure of the psalm and then I want to talk to you about the challenge of the psalm. Um, let's talk about the structure just a little bit. Psalm chapter 25 is the third of nine acrostic psalms. And that's basically just a big word. Acrostic describes a literary form where each verse or each stanza within the psalm begins with successive letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So if we were reading this in Hebrew tonight, the first verse would start with the Hebrew letter Aleph. Uh, alpha, sorry, Alpha. And then it would go on to Beta, and then it would go on to Gimel, and, but that's, that's Hebrew. In English, it would be A, B, C, D, E, and it would be really meaningful. When you translate the Hebrew scriptures into English, the acrostics fall apart because we have different um, alphabets, correct? But it, it's really interesting. Uh, James Montgomery Boyce, in his commentary on the Psalms, explains a couple of reasons why the psalmists used acrostics. And one of them is that in, an, in the original language, it adds a sense of beauty to the psalm. Of course, that is lost in translation. The second thing is, is that it gives the sense of the subject being covered completely because what you're doing is you're starting at A and you're going to Z. So when you're studying a subject using an acrostic, what you're communicating is that we have completely studied this. We've brought to you the whole counsel of this thing. And the last, and I think this had to do with the way the scriptures were taught to children, is that it aids in memorization. And I don't know if you, you know, in kindergarten and stuff, they teach you things about life, oftentimes using acrostics. They'll teach you a song that you know, A for apple, B for boy, or something like that, you know, and, and all of a sudden it sticks in your head and you've got it. Well, that's how they taught the children the Jewish scriptures. And so those things are a little bit of background of the structure, but I want to talk to you about the challenge of Psalm 25. The reason that I chose this title, The Mature Child of God, is that Psalm chapter 25 was written at a time in David's life where he had outgrown the foolishness of youth. Can, can anybody in the room relate to the foolishness of youth? How many of you did things that were stupid and foolish when you were young that you would never do as you got older because you've grown in wisdom? David is at a time in life where the foolishness of youth is no longer part of his makeup. David is at this time in life where he had become a mature disciple of the Lord. And what David is going to do tonight is he's going to teach us what it means to be a mature disciple of the Lord. And, and the challenge goes out like this. There's, there's two groups of people in the room right now. There's a group of people, when we get to the end of this Bible study, you're going to sit back and you're going to thank the Lord and you're going to say, I have been through so much junk in my Christian walk that I have become mature because of the trials and the challenges and the pain and the hurt. You may think of backstabbings or, or you know, people who turned on you or sickness or the loss of jobs or all sorts of things. But at the end of the night, you're going to sit back in your seat and you are going to say, God, you have been so faithful to use every trial to mature me and I'm different than I was 20 years ago. That's group A. Group B is going to get to the end of this Bible study and you're going to go, I'm a mess. I am still living with the foolishness of youth no matter what age I am. 
And the good thing, I guess, about the first group is you're going to be able to say, thank you, Lord, you've transformed me. The second group is going to be able to say, thank you, Lord, because one day you're going to transform me. And I pray that tonight is like a confrontation from the Lord for anybody who is in the room going, I can't believe that I'm 25 years old in the Lord, but I'm still as foolish as I was when I was five years old in the Lord. You're going to be confronted tonight, and you're going to be brought to a place where you realize, I have got to become deliberate about growing mature in my Christian faith. So with that in mind, we're going to look at four things tonight about the mature child of God. And in verses 1 through 5, what we're going to be digging into is how the mature handle personal attacks. H how we handle it when somebody treats us badly, when somebody attacks us or makes accusations against us or, or whatever. Uh, we'll read the first few verses and then I want you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 16. So the psalm starts out like this. David says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O oh my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed, and let not my enemies triumph over me. Now go ahead and turn to 2 Samuel 16. The, the verses that we just read reveal to us that David was dealing with some kind of attack in his life, coming from an enemy. We don't know this for sure, but Quite a few Bible scholars, and, and I don't consider myself a Bible scholar, but as a Bible teacher, I actually agree with what these scholars say. They believe that David wrote this shortly after the events that we're about to read about in 2 Samuel 16. They actually started in, in chapter 15. So in chapter 15, what we see is that Absalom, who was David's son, because of some mistakes that David made earlier in his life, Absalom got hardened against his dad. And Absalom started drawing the men of the kingdom to himself. He used flattery and he used other tools. And he drew the men of the kingdom to himself. And then he challenged David for the throne and as we get into chapters 15 and 16 of 2 Samuel, David is on the run. He has decided that he is not going to go to war with his son. He also doesn't want his son to murder him in the middle of the night. So he takes some faithful men and they leave some people in the palace and then they go on the run. And David is fleeing for his life. He, a number of things happen, but we'll pick it up in 2 Samuel chapter 16 verse 5. David's on the run, and it says, Now when the King David came to Bahurim, there was a man from the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera, coming from there. He came out, cursing continuously as he came. And he threw stones at David, and at all the servants of King David. And all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. Also Shimei said thus when he cursed, Come out, come out, you bloodthirsty man, you rogue. The Lord has brought upon you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, your son. So now... You are caught in your own evil because you are a bloodthirsty man. So as David is fleeing for his life, he's abandoned his kingdom, he's abandoned his palace, and he's on the run. This guy Shimei comes out and he starts making a ton of false accusations. And if you boil it down, what he's saying is that, David, you are reaping the consequences of things you've done in the past. God is basically paying you back because you stole the kingdom from my relative, King Saul. And David knows that every one of these accusations are completely false. And it's important when accusations come your way that you can look at them and you can say either, yes, there is some truth to this, or no, there is no truth to this whatsoever. And David, being a man of integrity, realizes there's no truth to this. God gave me the throne. God called me to this ministry. God took out Saul and then put me on the throne. So, you know what? David realizes these are just foolish accusations. And then verse 9. 
Then Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Please, let me go over and take off his head. I like guys like this. This is a guy that, you know, what I like about him, I, I don't necessarily think that he's doing the right thing, but as a leader, it feels so good to have people that are willing to stand with you when accusations come. And, and yet, it's interesting because a lesser man than David would have probably said, yeah, who does this idiot think he is talking to the king that way, throwing rocks at all of us? You know what? Bring me his head. Go ahead, bring me his head. But you know what? David wasn't a lesser man. David had outgrown the foolishness of youth. And notice what he does. Verse 10, verse 10 the, the king said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah? So let him curse. Because the Lord has said to him, Curse David. Who then shall say, Why have you done so? In, in other words, David is basically saying this to this guy, um, Abishai. He says, I am innocent of the things that this guy is accusing me of. And if you think about it, cursing at the king and throwing rocks at the king are not capital crimes. So we can't just go kill this guy because we don't like what he's doing. And so David continues and, and he says to him, I think this is a test from God. I think that it might be God who told him to come and to mistreat me this way and throw rocks at me as I'm fleeing from my kingdom because the Lord is testing me. The Lord wants to know how I'm going to respond when I am unjustly accused and unkindly treated and in the midst of my own son wanting to kill me, this other bozo comes along and starts treating me like God wants to know how I'm going to deal with being treated this way. And so David says to this guy, Abishai, just kind of picture it. I'm taking some liberties with the text, but he says, you know, you know, Abishai, not only is God testing me, but if I pass this test, God is going to bear fruit in my life. I am going to go through a season of personal growth because of how I face this trial, or I'm going to go through a season of of discipline from the Lord because I did not do what was right. And so look at verse 11. David said to Abishai and to all his servants, see how my son who came from my own body seeks my life? How much more now may this Benjamite let him alone, let him curse, for so the Lord has ordered him. And, and with the utmost of wisdom that a young man cannot have, but an old man should have, he looks at these guys who want to go over and kill Abishai. Oh, I'm sorry, um, Shimei. He looks at them and he says, don't you guys realize we're already at war with my son? Do we need a second army to be fighting against now? The Benjamites, the descendants of Saul? Do we need to have war on two fronts right now? David says there's no wisdom in that. He says, you guys want to go over and whack off this guy's head and start a war with the Benjamites. And what I'm saying is that I think God sent this guy to test me. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to keep walking. And we're just going to keep moving and we are going to ignore this guy. Let him throw rocks at us. Let him say things. So what? And now we turn back to Psalm 25. And it's at this point... With that as a bit of possible history, that's what I truly believe with all my heart was going on as Psalm 25 was written. David writes these words that we already read. He says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Now that brings a whole new perspective, doesn't it? David looks at God and he says, Okay, there's a guy over here on one hand, my son wants to kill me and take the kingdom, so I'm on the run. There's another guy that comes along, he's throwing rocks at all of us. He's making threats at us. I've got men that want to go kill this guy. And he says, but you know what, Lord? To you I lift up my soul. Oh my God, I trust in you. First he uses the word Jehovah. Then he uses the word Elohim. And in doing this, he's saying to the Lord, Father, I give myself over to you. You are my protector. You are the one who's going to take care of this, Lord, instead of me defending myself against these verbal attacks, I am going to wholeheartedly commit myself to you. 
And then he says this, and this is really important. He says, let me not be ashamed. Let my enemies not, let not my enemies triumph over me. Now, the word ashamed is our key for the entire evening. We need to understand what David is saying. If you went to Webster's New Collegiate Dictionary, this word ashamed or shame would be described as a painful emotion excited by a consciousness of guilt, disgrace, or honor. We talk about shame or being ashamed as the way we respond when we've done something wrong, we're feeling guilt, and now we feel ashamed in the Lord's presence. It's where we've been dishonored because of our actions. It's where we've brought dishonor and disgrace into our life because of things that we've done. But this is not the word that David is using. This is not the Hebrew word that David uses here. The, the word that David is using draws a picture of, of how those who have placed their trust in God will never be abandoned by him. See, David is saying, I got my son on one side trying to kill me. I got this other guy on the other side trying to start a fight with me. I've got men who want me to go do something stupid. And he says, Lord, what I'm going to do is I'm going to entrust myself into your hands. And when he says, let me not be ashamed, let not my enemies triumph over me, that's David's way of saying, by placing myself in your hands, Lord, I trust that you are going to do what only you can do, and that is to deliver me. See, if I stood here tonight and I said to you guys that my hope is in the Lord, and then I start defending myself against accusations, and I start paying back people evil for evil and insult for insult and injury for injury, am I really trusting in the Lord? I'm not. I've taken myself completely out of the Lord's hands, and I'm taking things into my own hands. And David says, when you start, well, let, let me just kind of keep reading. Look at verse 3. He says, indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. And there's two things in this verse that I almost got ahead of myself on. If you look at the beginning of verse 3, David is reminding you and I how foolish it is for us to defend ourselves and how foolish it is for us to take any matter into our own hands when people level various accusations against us or, or whatever they may do. Rather, what we need to do is we need to put our trust in God because once we put our trust in God, He promises that He's going to do what only He can do. And when He's done with that, we are never going to have to be ashamed. We're never going to be embarrassed to say, well, I chose not to defend myself. I chose not to fight back. And, uh, well, God let me down. You see, we'll never be in that position. When we trust in the Lord and we allow Him to defend us, He is always going to take care of what He promises He's going to do. But the other side of the verse, it says, let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. David is, is reminding us that those who make false accusations against other people, they always have this false sense of security, don't they? Have you ever noticed when a, when a fight is going on and someone is making accusations against somebody else, they always think God's on their side. And what David is saying is that the people that are going to be ashamed are those who don't trust in the Lord and they deal treacherously. They make false accusations. They say things that they should have never said and then they turn around and they say, God is going to defend me. God is going to defend me. And then David says, those are the people who are going to be ashamed. They're going to find out that God is not on their side. And so what David does, he's got this attack coming his way. On one side, Absalom. On the other side, this guy, Shimei. And as David is in this position, he determines that he's not going to defend himself. He is going to trust in the Lord. And David realizes that this is going to be turned into an opportunity for personal growth. And so I just want to pause for a minute. Anybody in the room right now who's experiencing any kind of trial, any kind of tribulation, you've got a conflict with another person and so far you haven't done anything stupid, but you're not sure that you won't tomorrow. 
okay? Because we're all human and oftentimes, you know, in the midst of a conflict, we're like, you know what? I'm just going to pray for them. And you're asking, Lord, bless my enemy. But Lord, shine light on this situation. Help them understand that, that they've misunderstood or this, that, and the other. After about three days of, you know, and you see another post on Facebook of somebody saying something anonymous, but the whole world knows they're talking about you, you know, and, and it just goes on and on and on. Eventually, you're just like, I've had it, and you blow up, and all of a sudden, you realize I've just taken it right out of the Lord's hands. If that's where you're at, and you haven't done anything wrong yet, this is what you need to hear. God has brought you to this moment to bring a teaching moment into your life. He's going to turn this trial, this false accusation, whatever this unjust thing is, into an opportunity for personal growth. And if you let him, he's going to grow you into a mature believer. If you don't let him, you're going to end up experiencing the discipline of the Lord you're going to end up experiencing what it's like to be ashamed because you defended yourself instead of letting the Lord defend you. Look at what David says now. This is, this is powerful. David says in verse 4, he says, Show me your ways, O Lord. And then he says, Teach me your paths. Verse 5, Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. I want to tell you that this verse is powerful. Because in the midst of everything that David is facing, he doesn't look at the Lord and say, Get Absalom! Get Shimei! And then this other guy, Abishai, Lord, you know, knock him on the head. What a moron! You know what he does? He looks at the Lord and he says some key things. Look at, the, look at the words. Show me your ways, O Lord. If we cry out to the Lord for him to show us his ways, he's going to do it. But not if we're already operating in our ways. Teach me your paths. You know, Abishai's path was pull the sword, lop off a head, keep moving. And, and you know, I'm sure there was a moment where David said, Hmm, it would keep other people from cussing at me, throwing rocks at me, if they heard or that we just whacked this dude's head off. But David said, that's not God's way. That's not God's path. Lead me in your truth and teach me. So think about this. Can you go to any scripture that says it's okay to cut a guy's head off because he cusses at you and throws rocks at your men? No, so David is saying... I got a guy over here who wants me to go beyond what the scriptures say and make a terrible mistake, but Lord, lead me in your truth and teach me. And then after he says that you're the God of my salvation, he says, on you I wait all the day. You know, when you're waiting for God to vindicate you, when you're waiting for God to pull you out of the muck and the mire that's sometimes created by gossip and slander and all that, what is the hardest thing to do? Wait. Especially when you got people texting you and going, did you see what they said now? Great. You know, how long are you going to wait before you say something? I'm just going to, I'm going to wait all the day. And then I'm going to wait all tomorrow. And I'm going to wait Saturday and Friday. Those are out of order, but in case you don't know the days of your week. I forgot that it was wet. So I'm going to wait Thursday and Friday. I am going to wait until the Lord moves. I can tell you the mistakes that I've made when I've had to deal with things that were said about me publicly or, or accusations made in ministry or anything like that. The biggest mistakes I've made is not just sitting back and saying, Lord, in you I put my trust and in you I will wait. One of the things I've learned is that when people's mouths are running, if you will give them enough time, they will hang themselves. That flapping mouth is just, the, the, just picture when that mouth is flapping, picture the noose just being tied once, twice, three times. Eventually that noose is going to be complete, wrapped around the neck, and all of a sudden the person is revealed for who they really are. 
but not because we defended ourselves, not because we went on a Facebook rant against their Facebook rant or whatever it is, because we sat with our mouth closed and our Bible open and we said to the Lord, you know what, God? I know what my way would be, but I need you to teach me your way. I need you to teach me your path. I need you to lead me in your truth because I'm about to do something that's going to turn this thing around and some heads are going to roll. And then afterwards, Lord, I'm going to be feeling like a total fool because you had a totally different plan. So David says, Lord, I know how the men here want to handle this, but I know that you want to handle it differently. And so we're going to transition now into the next section of Psalm chapter 25, and we're going to see something really interesting that I think is going to convict most of us as well. David is under attack, but instead of focusing on his enemy's sins, he goes into a time of self-examination. So we're going to call this how the mature handle personal failure, verses 6 through 11. He says, remember, O Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindness, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to your mercy, remember me for your goodness' sake, O Lord. So, I've noticed that anytime I'm in the midst of a conflict, I have a tendency to want to look at what the other party or parties has done wrong, because that makes me feel better about myself. Right? So I'm just hypothetically, Kelly and I really don't fight. Um, we did enough of that before we were saved. So we don't really fight, but every once in a while we squabble. And so whenever we begin to squabble, my first thought, I just got to be honest with you guys, I'll be totally transparent. My first thought is, I can't believe she did that. Right? I'm just telling you, I'm human. And I'm guessing, she, don't know if she'd admit this, but she's probably going, I can't believe he did that. Right? So there's a conflict. Right? And we're immediately wanting to justify ourselves and lay blame. But, but watch what David does. In, in the midst of David being under attack and in, in the midst of this major multi-sided conflict, David begins to examine his own life. And, and if you look down at verse 11, I want you to see what he found as he examines his own life. He says, For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. So see, in the midst of David being run out of town and in the midst of David having a conflict with this guy and having to correct one of his men, David starts looking inside. And as he looks inside, the first thing he says, he says, Lord, my own iniquity is great. So there's no mention here of Absalom's sin. There's no mention of Shimei's sin. There's no mention of Abishai's foolishness. The only thing that David sees is his own iniquity in the sight of the Lord. And, and so as David is now talking to the Lord, I want you to understand that David is what you and I would call saved. He was in a covenant relationship with the Lord that dealt with his sin condition, right? David is, is what we would call born again Old Testament style. And yet, he talks about his own sin he realizes that on a daily basis, I sin and I got to do something about this. And, and so what we're going to do is we look at David and how he dealt with his own sin. We're going to look at two ways that he used the word remember. Look first of all over here at verse 6. He says, remember your tender mercies and your loving kindness. David says, you know, Lord, when you, um, when you examine my life, you're going to find some things that don't please you. You're going to find some sin. You're going to find some iniquity. And as you do that, Lord, I'm asking that you remember that you are a merciful God. You have tender mercies and you have loving kindness. Don't we love to approach God that way? Lord, my sin is great and your grace is even bigger. I love 1 John chapter 1, right? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. David knew that. But then look at the second way he uses the word remember. Now he says, do not remember. He says, Lord, don't remember the sins of my youth and don't remember my transgressions. In other words, David says, I've done some pretty stupid things in my life. When I was younger, I committed adultery with a woman named Bathsheba. And in order to try to cover it up, I had her husband Uriah murdered. 
And then, Lord, later my son Amnon went in and raped his sister Tamar. And I didn't discipline him. Because I myself had been involved in sexual sin. How could I then deal with my son when he committed sexual sin? As a result, Absalom got a burr under his saddle because he is brother to Tamar. And he feels like I should have gone and disciplined my other son and I didn't discipline my other son. And you know what, Lord? When I was young, I made a lot of stupid mistakes. Those caused me to make other stupid mistakes. We'll just call them sin. And every time I sinned, because I didn't deal with it properly, it caused me to commit another sin. And that caused me this trouble. And now I'm on the run from my son Absalom. And it all goes back to the sins of my youth. And David goes, but you know what? You don't remember the sins of my youth. Isn't that awesome? We can look back and we can say all those stupid things I ever did, God doesn't remember them. But there's two things we have to pull out of this text, and this is really, really important. Forgiven sin is forgotten sin. Never forget that. When you have come to the Lord and you have confessed and repented, God cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. When he looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not your past sin. If your past sin is being brought up, the accuser of the brethren is behind that. And his name is Satan. And oftentimes, he is working through another born-again believer who he has twisted up and gotten them to focus on your past sins that Jesus has already paid for and that your Father has forgiven you for. So, forgiven sin is forgotten sin. However, if they're brought up, it is not God bringing them up again. It, it's Satan. But forgiven sin can also have lifelong consequences. In other words, we can't just say, well, I'm going to do this thing and then I'll ask forgiveness and it'll never affect me. David committed adultery with Bathsheba. And now all these years later, because of how that sin caused this sin and that led to this sin and that led to this neglect and this problem, David is on the run from his son who hates him. And we need to remember that forgiven sin can have lifelong consequences. And as David is dealing with some consequences... He goes before the Lord and he says, verse 8, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he teaches sinners in the way. And, and David is proclaiming that God is good. God is upright. In other words, he's not saying, you know, Lord, you're unjust in allowing me to suffer consequences that are related to my past sin. And then he comes along and he says, he teaches sinners in the way. And I think this is really important too. As you look at the entirety of the Bible, God deals with sinners in two different ways. We, we could just bring up a couple of verses that sum the whole thing up. When a person is involved in sin, whether they're, let, we're just going to talk about born-again believers. When a born-again believer is involved in sin, that's what David is talking about here, the Lord is going to deal with him in one of two ways. If that person is proud, the Lord is going to resist him. And sometimes you see that the Lord even destroys people because of their pride. But the scripture says that to the grace, God, to the humble, God shows grace, right? God resists the proud, but he shows grace to the humble. And what David is saying here is, is David is saying, you know, Lord, there's been some very stupid things I've done, some very sinful things. I'm still reaping the consequences. But for most of my life, Lord, I, I've approached you with humility. And because I've approached you with humility, you've responded to me in a specific way. Verse 9, David says, The humble he guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his way. You and I have seen this in our lives. People that we know, people that we used to go to church with, people that we know, and they start getting involved in sin, <clears throat> They're not willing to take godly counsel. They continue in it. There's not a spirit of repentance. There's, there's pride. There's arrogance. Brother, you, you got to stop that. You got to, you know, I love you, but I, I don't want to see this go on. You know what? You're just being legalistic, this and that. And what happens? Pretty soon, it's a broken relationship with the Lord. It's a broken relationship with the church. It's the broken relationship with their spouse. And, and as time goes on, 
that believer's life is in the toilet, so to speak, because of a lack of humility. Then you got that other guy at church. He comes and, or she comes and it's just like, hey, I need to talk to you. I, I can't believe what I did. I, and then they tell you this, you know, terrible, horrendous sin they've been involved with. And they're broken and they're crying and you pray with them and they repent and the Lord forgives them. And from that moment on, the Lord shows them kindness and he teaches them and he leads them. And they're always kind of waiting for the hammer to fall. Well, when is God going to punish me for that thing? And eventually you've got to walk up to him and say, listen, I don't think he's going to. Because you were filled with humility because you confessed it and, and you brought it before the Lord and you've turned from it. He's dealing with you with, with kindness. And he's teaching you a new way. Look at verse 10. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. And so David is basically saying people who obey the Lord experience his mercy and his truth in the midst of their consequences. And so tonight I'm going to ask you this, ladies and gentlemen. Are you the proud believer or are you the humble believer? Are you the person that gets involved in something and you have to get knocked upside the head over and over and over for the Lord to teach you a lesson? Or are you that person like David, a man after God's own heart, that it, just as soon as you commit some sinful act or some sinful thought, immediately conviction enters into your heart, you confess it, and you find that the Lord's gracious and He's merciful towards you. you. You almost never suffer consequences in your Christian life because you bring your sin to Him quickly. You're one of those tonight. You're, you're the, the stubborn Christian or you're the gentle Christian, you know. But one way or another, you're in that relationship with the Lord. And David is saying that the mature man or the mature woman has gotten his head knocked enough that he's chosen to just be that believer who is teachable. That person who is filled with humility. And, and then, real quick, verses 12 through 14, the third thing David teaches us about the mature believer is that the mature, they choose the fear of the Lord. Notice what he says here, verse 12. Who is the man that fears the Lord? Just real quick, to kind of give a definition of the fear of the Lord, if you study Scripture... I think a really good definition of the fear of the Lord is just simply it's a heart attitude. And it describes a person who has an awe for God, a reverence for God, an understanding that He is creator and we are created, therefore there's accountability. And yet, because of that, their daily choices please the Lord. And so they never have to worry about the fear of the Lord bringing wrath into their life. They don't want to hurt their relationship with the Lord, and so they, they choose to operate in the fear of the Lord, to, to live in a manner that chooses the Lord. And David gives us this list of blessings that God pours out on people who have the fear of the Lord. Notice he says, him shall he teach in the way he chooses. It's David's way of reminding us in the context of what we're studying that everything we experience turns into a personal growth opportunity. You got a conflict with somebody right now? the Lord is saying that he wants to teach you in the midst of this. Verse 13, he himself shall also dwell in prosperity and his descendants shall inherit the earth. Under the old covenant, you, you read all sorts of text in the Old Testament, especially in the Pentateuch and in the law, of how when a person obeyed the Lord, that God would bless them materially here on earth. And you see people like Abraham who, man, they were so prosperous. And it's related to their personal relationship with the Lord. In the New Testament, the prosperity that is blessed to you and I is a spiritual prosperity. Ephesians chapter 1, we've been given um, every blessing in the spiritual places, spiritual blessings. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the spiritual places in Christ, in heavenly places. So we can't read this and say, hey, listen, if I obey God, I'm going to get a Ferrari, and I'm going to be super rich, and I'm going to be... Pro that the Old Testament promises and the New Testament applications are a little bit different, but hey, I don't think there's anything wrong with when our ways please the Lord and the boss calls you in the office, and he says, you know what, we are super impressed 
with your work ethic. We believe it's tied to your faith in the Lord. And the big boss said to give you a raise. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, <laughs> God just blessed me with some prosperity. I get an extra hundred bucks a week or something like that, you know. But the thing is, is that that's not supposed to be our goal. Our goal is to know the Lord better, to walk with Him. And then check out this one. What a beautiful promise in verse 14. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear Him, and He will show them His covenant. If you dig into this a little bit, the Hebrew is describing that the Lord makes those who fear Him His confidant confidant that the Lord is going to make you his friend. He's going to speak to you things that he doesn't speak to other people. There's going to be divine insight. Now, there's something about that when you're just in such a deep relationship with the Lord and you sit down and you begin to pray and the Lord says, hey, I'm going to do this. And you're thinking, I don't know if that was last night's pizza or this morning's coffee, but I feel like the Lord just spoke so clearly and then a day or two later, something happens and you go, oh, that was the Lord speaking to me a secret thing because he loves me and, and because of my relationship with him, right? The last thing we're going to look at, verses 15 through 22, this is how the mature deal with personal struggles. And just a, a little bit of a, of a, a lead-in and then I'll get to this, but... Is there anybody in the room who, who never, ever gets down? Is there anybody in the room who doesn't occasionally wake up and just out of the blue you go, uh-oh, something's wrong? Yesterday I was on cloud nine with Jesus and this morning I woke up and it's like a, the Adam's family cloud is now over my life. We all deal with that from time to time, right? Sometimes we know why, sometimes we don't know why. Um, Christians get depressed. Christians deal with stress. Christians flip out once in a while, right? The book of Job taught us that Christians can flip out. And, and what's interesting is that as you get older and you, you develop this mature relationship with the Lord, these things happen probably no less than they did before. But the way we respond to them is so, so different. You know, you can always tell, again, you know, I, Facebook, social media. You know, we know what each other's thinking all the time. And every once in a while, something will pop up, and so I'm having a bad day. You know, blah, 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 blah. When, when you get to a place in your walk with the Lord where you're really a, a, in a place of maturity, you're, you're probably not going to be spouting your every thought on Facebook. They're actually going to be going more vertical. You may be going, okay, Lord, I'm having a weird day. I'm freaking out. I don't even feel like me today. But what we're going to see here is that it's dealt with so differently by a seasoned person who has outgrown the, outgrown the foolishness of youth. So we're going to go through these verses twice quickly. The first time I'm going to be pointing out all of David's struggles. And then the second time we'll go through it and we're going to see how David dealt with it. So move quickly. You're going to feel so much better about yourself when you realize that the great David, King David, the man after God's own heart, dealt with the same things that we deal with. Check this out. He says in verse 15, My eyes are ever towards the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. So David felt trapped by his circumstances. He felt like a bird that had been ensnared just waiting for the cat to come along and make lunch out of him, right? And then notice verse 16. You turn yourself to me and have mercy on me, for I am desolate and afflicted. David was dealing with some really strong emotions. And although he was with a group of faithful and dedicated men that were willing to chop someone's head off to uphold David's honor, notice that he felt desolate. That word tells us David felt alone. And because of Absalom's actions and Shimei's accusations, he felt afflicted, probably weak, maybe depressed. That, that word afflicted could mean low, low in spirit. So David's feeling weak and depressed. Verse 17, the troubles of my heart have enlarged. You ever feel like, Lord, I just can't take one more thing. Lord, I feel like the stress is going to kill me. And then something else comes along and you go, well, the troubles of my heart have been enlarged, right? But notice what he says, bring me out of my distresses. 
Not just my distress, it's plural. Distress is. So David had stressful things coming at him from all different directions. Look on my affliction and my pain. And then notice this. He says, forgive all my sins. Have you ever noticed that in the midst of going through a tough time, you become hypersensitive to your own failures? You're like, not only am I going through all this trial, but I, I think I might be the worst Christian on the face of the earth. You know? And, and then notice, he says this. He says, consider my enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with cruel hatred. Would you say that David's going through a tough season? It's a bad week at David's house, isn't it? How many of us can relate to some of these things? How about that one verse? The troubles of my heart have enlarged, right? I want you to notice, before every one of these, David gives us how a mature believer wants, should be dealing with these. This is how David dealt with his personal struggles. Look at verse 15. He says, my eyes are ever toward the Lord. So he knew his problems were there, but his eyes were fixed upon the Lord. Hebrews tells us, to fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. David says, get your eyes off the problems, get your eyes on the Lord. Verse 16, he says, turn yourself to me and have mercy on me. So David is crying out. He says, Lord, I need to experience your presence. I need to experience your mercy. So when these stressful seasons come, it's not more TV that we need. It's not more recreation. It's we need to find ways to find ourselves in God's presence. Verse 17, bring me out of my distresses. He says, Lord, only you can deliver me from these things that have me stressed out. Verse 18, look on my affliction and my pain. He says, Lord, turn your attention to these things that I can't do anything about. He says, consider my enemies. Boy, that's a whole Bible study right there, but he's just basically saying, Lord, don't forget that it's not just I'm having a bad day. There are people out to get me, but I have put my trust in you and you have promised that I will not be put to shame. And then he says, keep my soul and deliver me. I like that. Because when we're going through tough times, it's our soul that gets sick, isn't it? Our soul is our, our emotions, our heart, our thoughts our feelings. And in the midst of this kind of stress and trial, he says, Lord, I can't do anything about my soul, but you can. And Lord, please, and I like this, deliver me. He comes right out and he says, I'm in a mess. Save me. Help me. And then notice these last few lines. He returns to the original thought from the first couple of verses. He says, let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in you. He says, Lord, I'm, I'm not going to go cut Shimei's head off. I'm not going to attack Absalom. I'm going to trust you to work this out, and I am going to repeat myself, Lord. I have full confidence that you are not going to hang me out to dry. I am never going to be ashamed that I trusted in you rather than taking things in my own hands. And then verse 21, let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. David is kind of closing and he says, I have chosen to do what's right. I will continue to do what's right. And as I do what's right, I am going to wait on you. I think it's Isaiah 40, isn't it? Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. And David says, as a younger man, I would have pulled my own sword and killed this guy. As a younger man, I would have never left the city. I would have fought with my son. He says, as an older guy, I realize God's going to do something in the midst of this. I'm going to grow. I'm going to be a more mature man. I'm going to be a better king. I'm going to be a better husband. I'm going to be a better father. But I'm going to have to endure this trial, and I'm going to have to sit and wait on the Lord. And then verse 22. Some people think this doesn't fit, but it really fits. Redeem Israel, O God out of all their troubles. In, if the story that we're considering tonight does apply, what he's saying is, is, Lord, Absalom's rebellion has caused great trouble for our entire nation. He is not the right man for this job. So, Lord, we're asking you, send a quick solution 
to Absalom's rebellion. I don't know if you've ever prayed in the midst of a terrible, terrible situation and you're just saying to the Lord, God, what I see here is that if a solution doesn't come quick, terrible things are going to come. So, Lord, I need you as quickly as possible to act. Turn back to 2 Samuel. This time we'll go to the end of chapter 18, and, and this is where we'll draw it to a close tonight. 2 Samuel chapter 18. A battle has taken place between David's men and Absalom's men. Absalom is dead. He's been killed. David does not know that. He's not involved in the battle. And this is not the outcome that David expected. This is not the outcome that David wanted. This is not the outcome that David prayed for. It's the outcome that Absalom's stubbornness and his pride demanded. And so after all this heartache that Absalom has caused David, David still had a soft heart towards his son, 2 Samuel 18.33. Then the king was deeply moved and he went up to the chamber over the gate and he wept. And as he wept, he said thus, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only... I had died in your place. O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. I can't think of a worse outcome after such terrible conflict that David would have to look at his son and say, this is my fault. If I would have just disciplined Amnon for raping his sister Tamar. This snowball would have never started rolling. We would not be where we are. And, and David, he just, he goes and he weeps over his son. And I want to leave it hanging there tonight because I want to ask a few questions as we're preparing ourselves for communion. I'm going to I'm going to ask you to just say these in the first person quietly to yourself, but in the form of a question. So I'll just say it, but you, you let it apply to you. When I am personally attacked, do I trust the Lord to defend me or do I take things into my own hands? When I'm personally attacked, do I shut down or do I begin to look for the personal growth opportunity hidden behind the attack? When I'm personally attacked, do I immediately blame others? Or do I first examine my own life for sin that could have contributed to the conflict? When I face personal struggles, do I focus more on the things that I'm struggling with or on the Lord who is able to deliver me? How do I respond when calamity falls on someone who's responsible for bringing accusations or deep hurt into my life? Do I mourn for them? Or do I feel vindicated because of what they've done for me? Pretty powerful chapter tonight. Last thing that we're going to do as we prepare for communion is we're going to compare what we saw in Psalm chapter 25 to the life and the ministry of Jesus. And then we're going to take communion together. And so I'll ask this question right here. How did Jesus deal with the personal attacks and the struggles that he encountered? Look up at the screen. In Acts chapter 8, verse 32, speaking of Jesus, quoting from the Old Testament, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Everything that they did to him, he just kept his mouth shut. He waited on the Lord. He trusted in the Lord. Even unto death and by the resurrection, 
the Lord made Jesus completely unashamed. Luke 20, I have the rights. Look, Luke 23, verses 33 and 34. Look at this one. When they had come to the place called Calvary, where they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left, verse 34, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Wow. And this wasn't just a verbal attack. These were nails going through his body that would lead to his death. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He submitted himself to the attacks because he knew they would produce personal growth. Hebrews 2, 9, and 10. And you have to really see what's being said here. The author of Hebrews says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. I don't know if you've ever considered this, but Jesus was made perfect. You can say, wait, he was always perfect. He was always perfect, but he wasn't complete. He had to experience human suffering in order to be complete. And yet he willingly experienced that human suffering. He willingly went through everything that came his way because it was an opportunity for personal growth on top of all the things that he accomplished. And so tonight, as we prepare to take communion, I'm wondering, sometimes as Christians, don't we need to just imitate Jesus? I mean, I don't want to say it, but don't we just kind of have to have a sanctified suck it up once in a while? Where, where we're being mistreated and things are, are bad and, and we just, we want vengeance but then we start looking at the life of David, we look at the life of Jesus, and we realize, how about if I'm just willing to be wronged in order that the Lord could be glorified? How about if I'm just willing to be wronged in order that I could grow to that next level of maturity that I would never grow through or grow to if I decided to take things into my own hands? So this is what we're going to do as we prepare for communion. <clears throat> Ashley and, and the, the worship team are going to come up and maybe just during the first couple of minutes of the first song, let's all just stay seated. Let, let's spend a few minutes examining our hearts. Not thinking of sin against us, uh, of examining our heart like David did. And then, as you do business with the Lord, get up in groups of two or three or four or however, just grab your elements and, and just find a quiet spot and, and pray together about what we talked about tonight. We're only doing two songs, so you have to do this quickly. But rather than me leading communion tonight, we're, we're just going to have small groups taking communion with each other. There might even be a broken relationship in this room that, that while the first chord of the guitar is strummed, someone in the room might have to get up and walk across the room and say, hey, I need to talk to you. I'm offended at you, and I, I need to work this out because I can't approach the Lord's table tonight until you and I get this thing straight. So Father, I am so challenged tonight. We just love to defend ourselves and tonight what we've seen is that we will never be put to shame if we're willing to just let you deal with things the way you want to. So whether it's sin against us, whether it's personal accusations, Lord, whether it's harsh words and insults or someone has maybe thrown rocks at us in some form. Tonight we want to make a decision that we want the spiritual growth over the vendetta, over the vengeance, even if we're not wrong in any way. We want to suffer in order, Lord, that we could grow to a new level. We, we want to face personal trials, stresses, distresses, troubles of the heart, depression, brokenness, loss, all of these things, Lord, we, we want to face them in order that we could experience your grace as we go through them, that we could grow and that you would be glorified by the way your children handle these things. And so tonight, Lord, the first step is 
that Jesus paid for our sin and he washed us clean. And that's what we celebrate tonight, Lord, as we take the cup and we take the bread. We're being reminded that you have done everything that needs to be done. And now maybe the next step of our growth, Lord, comes in the form of a very uncomfortable trial. And tonight we've made the decision. We're going to grow through it. So Lord, we love you. And we praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 